Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. All right, my name's Greg. I'm an alcoholic. I'm also a tech nerd, have been most of my life, and uh, I just took my pulse right before this, and it's elevated about 20 beats per minute. In my <laughs> um, so let me start off with the uh, preface here. The purpose of the Peninsula Primetime Meeting is to talk about the reason to come to Alcoholics Anonymous, to expose Alcoholics Anonymous not just as a word, but as a living, mind-powered disease. How the disease appears and functions in our lives today in order to deepen our awareness of what we are up against. Alcoholism is called ism because it is alive and functioning, and it needs to be treated. We discuss here strictly the disease as it manifests in each of our own personal lives, the way our behavior is this day, the way we react or look at people, places, and things. We do not talk about our drunkalogs, yesterday's problems, or blaming other people. We talk only about looking inwardly, describing how self Behaves in the that's hard. Um, how how self behaves in the day we are in. The format of this meeting is to listen to a sober member of the primetime group of Alcoholics Anonymous share their experience on alcoholism, ego, and self, and how by application of the principles spiritual in nature, when practiced as a way of life, expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. The speaker portion of this meeting will last approximately 20 to 25 minutes, followed by discussion. And we are recording this meeting. uh, Once a month, we record our meeting here, and it does go live. So I'm going to try not to cuss, and if I do, somebody hit me. (laughs) Um, Anyway, I'd like to to welcome the newcomers, and uh, especially you, Matt. I've, I've been sober this long and not having been to an AA meeting. I hope... I hope I don't set the benchmark for you. Keep, <laughs> keep coming back. There's lots of meetings. Um, I don't speak for Alcoholics Anonymous as a whole. I'm just one person who considers myself a member of Alcoholics Anonymous by Tradition 3. Um, if you don't hear what you need tonight, please keep coming back. Come back to this meeting. Come, you'll hear different speakers. You'll hear different discussion. Come back to any of the other hundreds of meetings uh, that we have in the Bay Area uh, every week. Um, so I want to do a little bit of identification, and um, I'm going to try not to do any drunk logging, but I think it's important to say things that people can identify with, um, or not identify with. But some people will, some people won't. Um, but at, most importantly, to be honest about myself. So I'm 22 months sober this time, okay? It's the length of time I've been sober. The most time I've been sober is 12 years. Um, I've been around AA for 28 years. Um, today, I have a sponsor I communicate with regularly. I have worked and I'm working the steps. I go to three to four meetings a week and I have service commitments and I have a daily routine. Thanks to my sponsor who kept on me about it. I have a daily routine and I practice to get in tune with a power greater than myself. Um, and those things work for me. They work for me today. Um, so obviously I had a lot of relapses, or more, more, than, more than one relapse. Um, and I wanted to talk, talk on that. That's one of the points I wanted to get across. And one of the attractors for me coming to the primetime format was hearing speakers who had relapsed before. Because for me, having been uh, continuously sober for 12 years and having been, you know, sort of a big shot in my own mind uh, in AA, I had incredible shame about relapsing. Now, how did I relapse? It was pretty simple, actually. I stopped doing the things I was told to do in this program. Stopped going to meetings, stopped talking to my sponsor, stopped working the steps. Simple as that. And every time I stopped doing that, I relapsed. So I've been very empirically proven to myself scientifically that that's what happens. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So to anyone else who's relapsed, don't don't do what I did. The relapse caused me to stay away for a long time, and that can be fatal. Um, so keep coming back. Uh, I paid a lot of attention reading the big book this time around, and it's amazing 
how much relapsing was going on at the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, you know, people, when I came back, and, uh, you know, people would say, well, of course you relapsed, you're an alcoholic, right? Um, so it's important for me to remember that, but I just wanted to get that message off to anybody else who's relapsed. It's hard to sober up, and it's harder still if you don't come back. Um, so what, it, what brought me to primetime? Primetime was attractive to me because I came here, and I heard about relapse, and I heard about something else, something new that I hadn't really clicked on before. And there's a couple of people I'd like to thank. I'd like to thank Frank P., who was the first person who found me Reannouncing myself as a newcomer in a meeting, and he gave me the prime time is now card with the website on it, and told me about the meeting. And of course, I'd like to ask, I'd like to thank John, who's been so important in my sobriety this time around. Um, and I'd like to thank a lot of you who've helped me because you've also seen me over the last two years go through a few different phases of coming to this meeting every Saturday. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, but I've gotten an enormous amount of help from people here in prime time, and that's kind of the story behind AA. We help each other out. So I'm supposed to talk about the purpose of coming to AA. Um, basically, I come to AA to learn to do what I need to do to live with one of my mental illnesses. Okay. Alcoholism, <laughs> addiction, it's my mental illness. Um, I'm glad we started with the doctor's opinion. Uh, that we start this meeting with the doctor's opinion. There's a lot of doctors in my story. Um, uh, for me, it took a long time before I finally fessed up and owned up to the fact that I have a mental illness. I have, I have something that completely reforms and refocuses and realigns my view of reality, depending on my state of mind. It's pretty amazing. Um, what helped me come to that conclusion about alcoholism? Um, part of that is, oh, the other reason I come to AA is to help myself by helping others. Um, and also to establish a relationship with a higher power, which I didn't pay as much attention to. But if you read the big book, there's actually a line where it says, this book is to help you establish a relationship with a power greater than yourself. I had missed that in the last few times. So, to get, in, to get into it, um, I am one of those people, one of those grave and a mentally disordered people, grave emotional and mental disordered people, okay? I'm the ones in, the, in, the, uh, in how it works. Um, I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people because I'm dual diagnosis. I have alcoholism, and I also have um, bipolar or manic depressive illness. And it's pretty documented. It's not like I'm reaching, I read a book and I think I have it. I mean, I've, it's... I've had a lot of run-ins, which you'll hear about. Um, so I really got it. And what's really interesting, and that's kind of a little bit what else I want to get across, is my dual diagnosis, both, both diseases feed on each other, and they have lots of things in common. Um, so here's, and I did say I was a geek, so here's just some facts. So the National Institutes of Health counts about 17 million people in the United States with alcohol use disorder out of 317 million people. That's about a little over 5% of the population. Um, there's about 5.7 million bipolar people in the population. Interestingly, 5% of, of civilians can develop alcoholism, but 60% of people with bipolar develop some kind of substance abuse disorder. Um, the interesting thing about that is, if you assume a bipolar person who has alcohol use disorder, or alcoholism, has the same chances of coming to AA for help as someone who doesn't have bipolar disorder, the interesting thing is if you do the little math there on the little intersecting sets, you find out that it's potentially as high as one in five people in AA, in the 1.295 million people that AA just counted in the census um, in 2014, could be bipolar. So um, I used to be really, uh, I couldn't accept it, just like I couldn't accept my alcoholism. I couldn't accept my other diagnosis. Um, but I talk about it now because maybe it helps somebody else. Um, and both diseases work hand-in-hand hand to make things really slippery. 
So has anybody ever experienced this euphoria, inflated self-esteem, poor judgment, aggressive behavior, agitation or irritation, <laughs> increased physical activity, risky behavior, careless of dangerous use of drugs or alcohol, frequent absences from work or school, poor performance at work or school, sadness, hopelessness, suicidal thoughts or behavior, anxiety, guilt, sleep problems. I had done all of those before I was formally diagnosed <laughs> at age 40. And I had done all of those as a result of alcoholism. I didn't need my other disease to experience those things. But that's two-thirds of the symptom list for bipolar illness. So the only thing different about it from uh, uh, alcoholism, my alcoholism for my bipolar is I get a few more symptoms because I'm bipolar. So, a little bit about me, um, just to show that, uh, that there's no rhyme or reason to who gets this disease or who gets to recover, um, I realize. Um, so, I did an inventory to, to identify my history. I, did, I inventory good things, and then I inventory bad things that were a result of my uh, bipolar illness, and then bad things as a result of my alcoholism that were clearly separable. So just good things, which is a little bit about my backstory. I was raised in San Francisco. I was raised upper middle class. My dad was a doctor, mom a nurse. I went, got sent to private schools. I had a Jesuit education for high school. I, have, I was a math and science geek, loved it. Um, I went to UC Berkeley and was studying computer science right when this whole thing was just preceding the explosion of the internet. I worked professionally when I was in high school and uh, college for anywhere from $50 to $100 an hour, which back in the 80s was a lot of money for a kid. Um, it would let me buy a lot of drugs and alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it enabled alcoholic drinking so bad. I mean, my, my first drink was 14. My second drunk, which is around the same age, a few months later, was my first blackout. So my second drunk was my first blackout. My, I started drinking really regularly when I was about 18 or 19, and by 23, I was ready to be dead. I, was, I weighed 245 pounds, I was bloated, sweaty, lying on the floor of my flat. All the furniture had gone because the cat and the girlfriend had moved out. Um, I was basically, my family had let go of me, my friends had let go of me. I mean, I was ready to die. I was absolutely, completely on a, on a fatal track. Um, luckily, I asked for help, and I got help from someone in Alcoholics Anonymous. And those people practiced a good old-fashioned 12-step on me. You know, take the guy, put him in the car, take him to the meeting, take him home, tell him not to drink, pick him up, do it again the next day. That's how I got started. So I got sober at 23, and I stayed that way until I was 35. And during that time, in, and I was in San Francisco, I did tons of service. I went to lots of meetings. I was very involved in young people's conferences, and um, I made tons of great friends, more friends than I ever had before. So I always been kind of introverted and nerdy, and AA just illuminated my life. I got married to someone in AA. I had two kids with her. I had I was working in my profession at various companies, climbing the ladder. I got lots of kudos. I got to travel the world which is cool because AA is wherever you go. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Certainly certainly towns where you're doing business, there's AA meetings available. Um, the other bad thing about business travel is it was a great place for me to sneak. Mm -hmm. And I slipped a number of times uh, doing business travel. Um, so I got lots of kudos. Uh, I have four patents. Uh, we moved from San Francisco to this suburban paradise. And... Um, I had lots of responsibility, and I made lots and lots of money. And from exactly at the same time as we moved down here, I stopped going to meetings. I stopped talking to my sober friends. I stopped having service commitments, and I just went into complete work all of it. And it didn't take long. It took, like, I think three years, four years before I had my first slip. So this, that's my, that's like me in a nutshell. Um, now, here's some of the things, that, the bad things that happened to me with bipolar. So I, I ceased to be able to function to, to the point where either people couldn't deal with me or I couldn't get out of bed. Um, I was isolated and in, in bed, depressed for months, um, barely getting out of the house. I had anxiety. 
another common symptom, pressured speech, um, spending orgies. Um, I did a few of those. Um, and I've had, I had, in my most recent manic episode, I, I, after the fact, I wrote them down just to really make sure I was ready to accept this. I had 54 distinct delusions, like the delusion that uh, the doctor's opinion talks about of not being able to distinguish the true from the false. I was in the psych ward twice because of my disease. I had four disability periods, uh, lost relationships. That's pretty much it that I can attribute solely to bipolar. Now I'll give you the alcohol and drugs bad things. Blackouts, fights, going from being quiet and introverted to being a loud asshole and loaded. Mm -hmm. I would experience a complete personality change. Hangovers, vomiting and urinating in inappropriate places. A lot of that. <laughs> lies. Lies, lies, lies. I lost a car. It happened to be my dad's. But I did. I actually lost it. Like three days. We didn't know where, where the hell it was. <laughs> um, weight gain. Weight loss. Uh, I have two drunk drivings. Um, my, the second one was really notable because I wasn't even driving at the time. I was stumbling out of a liquor store, and as soon as I got in the car, that's when the cops arrested me because they were parked right behind me. <laughs> um, drunk in public, kicked out of clubs and restaurants, had to withdraw from college. Um, I've had tours of the Oakland, San Francisco jails, San Francisco Park Station, San Mateo County Jail twice. Um, I've lost jobs twice. I've lost two relationships. I drank and used around my kids. It led to my divorce. Um, it got me barred from custody of my kids. It got me barred from visitation with my kids. I lost most of my fr friendships. My family relationships were on the skids again. Um, way back in my history, I, I wrote it down here just for point of reference. I killed my fireplace once with a nine millimeter. It's, I, it's insane behavior, right? Sit in your living room and empty a gun into your fireplace. Well, I did that, and it's insane. And that's something I did because I was drinking. Um, I lived in squalor and isolation for a long time. I committed crimes. I consorted with prostitutes. I hung out with, uh, hung out in the tenderloin with really scary people. Why? Because I was a scary person by then. Um, I was hospitalized and treat, treated for alcoholism three times. And most importantly, besides my relapses, I did real and lasting damage to other people, <clears throat> not just myself, my family, my friends, my kids. So, that, so to me, it's like that list, because of alcoholism, is so much worse than my other disease. They feed on each other. There's a lot of things they have in common. But the biggest thing is that I have no need to have my personality changed by drug or alcohol. If I do, a long list of bad things happen. Um, when I came to this meeting, I heard Bob Anderson, who I think founded these groups. Um, and Bob said something really important. We lost the power of choice in thinking, not just drinking. And that really, that's, that clicked with me this time, the prime time, because I started to talk about the mental process of my alcoholism. Um, this was a really powerful concept. The other thing that got said here is that it's alcoholism, not alcoholism. Was it? Was it? Was it? Um, in other words, it's alive and kicking in me all the time, continuously. From the time I get up in the morning to the time I go to bed. And it has to be treated. And that was something I completely uh, ignored before. I'd heard it before, but I didn't, I, um, didn't, I hadn't felt it. Um, the other thing that was said here, which is said elsewhere too, is that knowledge, which I happen to love, I love knowledge, I love facts, I love formulas, I love discoveries. That stuff can't help me. No matter how much I know about myself, that's not going to help me heal myself. And that phrase that you hear here is, self cannot heal self. Um, that started to hammer home. 
only what I found was that certain prescribed behaviors, not thoughts, behaviors, were the things that could um, help me deal with my alcoholism. So things like going to meetings, uh, working with my sponsor regularly, um, having service commitments, those things I talked about before that um, Alcoholics Anonymous provides for us. And also, it gives me the chance to be plugged into other people who have the same problem, which means they can also be a sounding board or a mirror or even a, an alarm siren <laughs> for me when I need it. Um, there's a couple of things. There's some, you know, I read a lot of shrink crap, and um, <laughs> and I talk to a lot. I talk, I talk to a lot of shrinks, and they have special words for everything. And two of my favorite uh, symptoms uh, are lack of insight and um, ideas of reference. Lack of insight is where you don't know you're crazy. And that really describes me. Um, even when I'm not drinking or using, and when I'm not having a <clears throat> depressive or manic attack, I can still see how my mind is warping relative to reality. That I don't have insight that someone else might have if they were sitting right next to me on my shoulder speaking into my ear. They would see things completely differently than the way I do. The other thing they talk about is ideas of reference, and that's, that goes so far as to be, it's the weird stuff, that's the really weird stuff, you know, when you think the radio is talking to you, that's what ideas of reference is. Well, guess what, I, in my alcoholism, I have that in a mild way. In my bipolar, I, I've had it for real, but in my alcoholism, I have it in a mild way, because I walk in the room and I think, what are all you guys thinking about? <laughs> you are all thinking about me. What are you? <laughs> and, and what it is, is ideas of reference is a manifestation of self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. Um, I also learned here that, um, I learned a couple things. One, not to be higher or lower than anybody else. And it was very important to not be lower. Um, it's, it's, re it's really easy to wallow in feeling lower than everybody else. <clears throat> um, I learned about, uh, from reading uh, Thibaut papers, um, that we have this property, Dr. Thibaut, more shrink stuff, mm -hmm. thought that we were rather grandiose, impatient, had inflated egos, and essentially wanted omnipotence. And um, I have that. I have all of those things. But I have them in this nasty, power, passive-aggressive way, you know? I'm not, I'm not, I don't let them out uh, for everybody to see. They, they sneak out. Um, they sneak out like a serpent. Um, so my inflated ego, I don't, I don't I try like crazy not to share that with other people. Um, the grandiosity that goes through my mind at least once or twice a day. Um, it's, you know, I'll have some idea about how I'm more than what I actually am. Um, so it's fascinating. It's a whole head trip. The biggest thing that I struggle with, which I heard people here in prime time talking about specifically that I wasn't hearing about other people in other meetings talking about, was my thoughts swirling in regret over the past and swirling in fear over the future. That the time was now. Prime time is now. And when I'm preoccupied with the future or the past, I'm not here. I'm not here, and I'm not. I'm not in touch with my higher power. Um, so I'm also supposed to talk about the first three steps and how they work in my life. Um, well, here, just here's a little break. I told you I love little studies and things like that. You've heard from me how like my mind is not a friendly place, right? It's not. It's not a good place. In fact, I'm my own worst enemy. But I'm not the only one which makes me feel good. There was a recent study. <laughs> there was a recent study just published this week where they did 11 studies of groups of people and asked them to sit in a room for 6 to 15 minutes alone with their thoughts. Yeah. Over half of them rated it as a terrible experience. 66% <laughs> of men and 25% of women used the sh self-shocking device 
to get through the time sitting with their own spots, thoughts. They were given a little thing that would give them a little shock. And so they actually, they actually took that. So I'm not the only one who has a tough time with my thought world. The important thing, though, is that my thought world is not the real world. Um, and it's particularly not so for me. Um, and what's important is my action world, my behavior world, what I do. Um, and those are the things that ultimately shape, shape my thoughts. So on the steps, you know, for me, step one is all about honesty. Um, everybody had that moment of clarity, right? Where that, that one second where we were honest with ourselves and said, this shit's got to, oops, sorry, this poop's got to stop. <laughs> <laughs> And many times I'd have that moment of clarity, and then it would go away. But luckily, I got here. Um, the other thing about step one is being, to, being able to identify with others. Um, surrender. For me, that's giving up fighting myself. Um, I'm not surrendering to the disease. I'm surrendering to my the concept that I have good things I can contribute to the healing process. I really don't. Um, uh, so I have to just have to sort of take myself out of it and ask a, a different kind of power, including you, to come into my life. Um, the other thing is uh, about acknowledging unmanageability. So not only was it powerless over alcohol, but my life was unmanageable. Well, it didn't seem that way, man. I had all kinds of cool things going on, and kids and pools and private jets and hundreds of people working for me and all this kind of crap. And um, how could my life be unmanageable? Well, as we say in this meeting, it's our thought life that's unmanageable. And my thought life was unmanageable. Um, and for someone who's a math nerd, uh, it's actually a really easy probability argument. My, you know, what do I have? I have a brain that doesn't always work right. You know, ten fingers, ten toes, two arms, two legs. There's only so much I can control in this vast universe that God's given us. And I always forget that. I always have this idea that I can control myself. All right, well, you know, and when you consider the fact that I'm made up of about a trillion cells, it's kind of hard to tell them all what to do. Um, so when you stop and you think about it, God's like in my face all the time. Um, in step two, I had to come to believe two things. And this is kind of the main part of my message. I'm insane. Okay? Not just for the other disease, but for this disease. I can't, the step <coughs> is, came to believe that power in ourselves could restore us to sanity. So if you accept that, you accept that you're insane until you start working the program. I had a hard time with that. It's a hard time to accept. And I think I ended up having to go through the pain of accepting my other illness before I could really accept my alcoholism and addiction as a mental illness. Because I thought, if I'm not drinking or using, I'm okay. It's not the way it works. Um, and step two also said that there's hope for a power um, greater than ourselves. And for me, sometimes the best I can do is just not me. Sometimes the biggest my power, my higher power can be is that which is not me. Um, so maybe it's you. Maybe it's the meeting. Maybe it's the service commitment. Maybe it's my kids. Sometimes maybe it's the universe. You know, I have different levels which I feel plugged in at different times. Um, unfortunately, I'm not, uh, I have had semi-religious experiences, but it was when I was sick. <laughs> So all of my all of my uh, religious awakening or all of my spiritual awakening has had to do with the educational variety, and my education comes and goes, and I'm always learning more. Um, so no, I don't. I don't have a burning bush telling me um, how to stay sober, unfortunately. Um, and in step three, when I made a decision, I made a decision since my higher power is not me to not listen to just myself. Right. By that simple same math, plugging the variables in, I made a decision not to listen to myself um, and to place myself behind other sources of direction. That's what step three means for me. So 
that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, my key messages were, if you relapse, keep coming back. This is a mental illness. I don't, I don't need to go quote all my statistics about how fatal this illness is. It's very fatal. If you, don't, if you want a good example, just go back a week before last when the Washington Post released a report about 10% of all deaths for people between 18 to 65 or 56, something like that, are related to alcohol use. Um, it's profoundly fatal and dangerous. And combined with my other disease, I have a really bad deal. Um, it takes a lot off my statistical <laughs> life expectancy. So, only certain behaviors give me the opportunity to free myself from myself and let my higher power come in. And sometimes you are the manifestation of, you are the only manifestation of my higher power. And sometimes I get more. But these behaviors are, I go to three to four meetings a week, I work one-on-one -on -one with my sponsor regularly, preferably weekly, and I really appreciate that he makes time for that. I continue to work the steps from the big book. Um, I do service, for me, Chairs are a sacred duty. Pick up the chairs, put them away. Pick the chairs, put them out. Pick them up, put them away. Keeps me at right size. <laughs> and the other thing it does for me is I'm so self-conscious and self-centered that um, it gives me something to do <clears throat> when I would otherwise just be tripping out up here. So doing service, and I do other service, uh, central office delegate, I've been a coffee maker, a greeter, all kinds of things. And... Um, I will continue to do that. Um, I'm also now doing daily reading, and I'm trying to meditate. Um, I found out something kind of interesting. People who have had uh, psychotic symptoms, like bipolar people or schizophrenic people, I found out they're not allowed to go to meditation retreats. Yeah. That's true. Lo and behold. <laughs> anyway, I've been trying to I've been trying to meditate on my own. And um, and I definitely read every day, but sometimes I'll be doing my spiritual reading and my mind will just go, zzz, zzz, and want to think about what I'm going to do next or whatever. It's just it's interesting to watch it, and that's what that's what the meditation is about. I'm not a good meditator now, but I know that that's the experience I'll have, which is you start. I'll have a separation from the that which is me spinning uh, those thoughts that are spinning around, and that which is me. <laughs> according to according to the way God made me, um, try to help others. That was it's been a huge huge part of Alcoholics Anonymous since the beginning is trying to pass it on and carry the message. It's like the first pay it forward program, really, um, and contemplating God. I don't know what God is. I just know that um, I I read all the arguments about why the universe appeared from nothing in a random explosion uh, due to quantum physics and all that. It just doesn't work for me. There's got to be something more. There's just so much complexity and amazing stuff in this world. Um, so I like to contemplate that. But sometimes all I can do is contemplate when I'm going to get to the next meeting. So with that, thank you. Okay, let's see. Following sharing, the speaker reads, The meeting is open for discussion. We ask that you limit your share to three to four minutes so that everyone may have opportunity to participate. We also ask that you share only about alcoholism, ego, and self, and the first three steps. If you stray from the format, you will be gently asked to stay on topic. Our timekeeper tonight is... Josh. Josh. Thank you, Josh. And if you want, come up to the podium. <laughs> Isn't he the best? <laughs> My name is Norman Alcoholic. Uh, Are you going to move it away because I talk too loud? No, no, you turn it this way. So. <laughs> okay. Um, so I met, um, okay, so we're very different, but I'm so psyched that like we're almost exactly the same in certain ways. Um, otherwise, I'd probably be dead. I uh, met Greg, and um, I'm trying to decide whether I should tell you the story of why I call him Barnacle all the time or not. 
Anyway, so I met Greg at the Friendship Hall meeting. I was the treasurer, and Dan was the secretary, and he put $60 in the basket, and I was like, okie dokie. Um, <laughs> and I had no idea. I'm just like, Ooh. um And uh, then then fast forward to this meeting, and um, I have a similar illness. Well, I have the same illness, but I'm not going to say it because then maybe you won't know. Um, but I think I woohooed at the wrong time because no one else was doing that. Oh, shit. Um, but if you just come to this meeting for six months, you'll know anyway. So it's not like i got to keep it secret. Um, anyway, so um, I was, my doctor was having me go off this one medicine, and I was having a really hard time. And I had... For the first time in my life, I had an actual plan of how to kill myself. And I have a wonderful husband, beautiful children. I have a great job. Um, none of that shit mattered because the chemicals that I have a dog, two dogs. Well, one's dance. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I, I was so fucking crazy. I, and I just felt so alone. And I came to this meeting. And, um, and afterwards, I, I went up to Barnacle and I said, Do you go to those meetings? And he's like, and that's how I knew I was a little, a little too strong. Um, he backed up a couple steps, and he goes, what meetings? And, I, you know, these meetings for people that are mental. And um, he goes, no, but I really want to. And none of that mattered. What mattered was the conversation that followed. And that's the reason why I went home. I talked to my doctor. My medicine got adjusted, and I'm here today, and I'm, like, more spazzy and happy and not fucking depressed and everybody goes oh shit she's sharing again it's time to go to the bathroom um you know i i came here and you know i i have like this problem that i read minds mostly i read dan's mostly i read dan's mind and never he never says anything good about me um and everybody else anytime i read anyone's mind it's always nasty mean evil shit and uh and then finally i realized that's because I'm not supposed to be reading anybody's mind. You know, I, I, uh, this woman called me yesterday and I met her like a year ago and she asked me to sponsor. You know, that's a really cool thing that I got from the discussion with this woman. She's in her 60s and she called me and she said, I drank today. And I was like, oh, I haven't talked to her in like eight months. And uh, I'm like, oh, okay. And then she starts talking about her daughter and how she's evil and not paying her loans back right, blah, 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 blah. And I said, so wait a minute, what? how long had you been sober? And she said, well, you know, June. I'm like, it's July. And uh, anyway, long story short, uh, what I felt got, took away from the conversation was that I have something worth giving away. And five years, ten years, twenty years, I didn't have that and and I do because of meetings like this and because of people like Barnacle keeping me alive and keeping me on the straight and narrow. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. All right, all right. I'm Frank, and I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was looking through my stuff today. I was trying to find a chip for somebody who just had three years, and uh, I ran across a, a card. It was personalized. I'm an AA member card that some people write, and this one said. You can't think yourself into right acting. You have to act your way into right living. And all of a sudden, I had this epiphany. That's backwards. I don't know about any of you, but I've, I've acted without thinking before. And it's usually a big mistake. <laughs> you know, the big mistake I made, and I, I've been in AA a grand total of 31 years, if I really get in the last almost 15 clean and sober, and I went in and out. And I had to literally take this stuff apart and analyze what it means. I, I stopped looking for people to tell me what it means because they were misinterpreting it. Words have a meaning to them. They're not subjective. The reason I can't just play the tape back and use self-knowledge to stay sober is because I am an alcoholic. That's the mark of an alcoholic. On those hangover mornings, I was never going to drink again. I was done, and I meant it. But then something would happen, and I noticed the increments got shorter and shorter. Pretty soon it was by noontime. Having a drink seemed like the thing to do at the time. And that's true powerlessness. And then I was coming to, and my thought is, I'm never doing this again. And my next thought is, that's what you always say. You know that's not going to last. I could not stop. That's powerlessness. And I need something outside of me because my best effort, my so-called willpower, my human resources is marshaled by the will, were insufficient. They did fail utterly. I needed something outside of me. I had to get something greater than me. I, first, I had to get that knowledge that I'll never remember yesterday's drunk. Okay, that is the first step. That's what sets me apart from a hard drinker, and the book talks about that. 
Insanity, I had all kinds of definitions of insanity. Putting a loaded 357 to your head at the hammer cock, that's not really insane rational behavior. But I, I kind of like to use the term today, spiritual malady, rather than mental illness, because they might want to come in and take all my guns if I start saying that. <laughs> I wouldn't be happy about that. And I've been around people. I used to work in a detox many years ago, and I remember people that were convinced they heard there's somebody in the ductwork, in the ventilation system. There's a guy in there. And there's people talking. People would talk to refrigerators. That's called the delirium tremens that people get. And that's why alcoholics used to be put in nut houses when they were actually detoxing, because they're hearing voices. Well, to them it's real. But that's part of the. When you get, I never got to that point, but I, I know that happens because I've been around enough people that do that have had that. You know, so there's powerlessness and and I needed something greater than me, and, and being able to turn my will and my life over to that. It was just something outside of me because I didn't have the answers. And I didn't get into the actual mind power part of this until I got into the fourth step and started seeing things. But I had to think different to start acting different is really what I wanted to get across. I was just trying to force will it and just act right. Just straighten up and cut that shit out and act right. And I'd always fail. I failed before I ever took a drink. Because that thing that people call mental illness, that is the alcoholism. That is the mind-powered part. And that's what I need the steps for. I haven't been able to find anything pharmaceutical because I spent years looking for it. To turn me from a pessimist into an optimist. You know, I had to change the way I look at things. Thank you. My name's Howard. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. And I've had to play with Dr. Poop, too. So I've got a mental illness um, in a, on top of my alcoholism or underneath it or something. So I relate, I relate to that part. I also relate, Greg, to the, to the thinking, right? You know, it's like I love to think. <laughs> you know, I do. I really love it. And it's like, um, it is my, it has been most of my life the way I've dealt with the world. You know, it's like, you know, it's in my shield. It's where I feel powerful. It's all of these things that are so important, you know, to myself, to my feeling of myself. And none of that is real. None of that is actually, I mean, I can learn good things about reality, you know, uh, but, um, the thoughts, the words won't get me where I need to go to stay sober. I've got to get an experience. You know, I have to have that spiritual experience. The book talks about um, that's the aim of the whole thing. And experience is not is not articulate. It's not words. It's it's wordless. It's a connection. It's an experience of of, of a higher power. It's a spiritual moment. You know, and um, we were just reading today in uh, Sermon on the Mount. In a beautiful uh, description of, of the of the uh, you know uh, spiritual bread, he was talking about you know uh, food for your soul, you know, and it's like um, it's 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 a he talks about realization, you know, and that is basically it's going off in my being that I'm in, in contact here, and you know that is what will keep my mind quiet. No, hardly anything else will, because I just, you know, I'm yada, 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 and, and frequently running off into the future for fear. You know, I pass for regret somewhat, but the future is my, my you know, I'm full of fear, and I, and I go away, and uh, I have to I have to reset, you know, and, and come back to the present moment. And, um, you know, prime time is now, like you said, and it's, uh, it's uh, you know, I can't do anything tomorrow or yesterday. I can do things today, and I can't experience anything, right, tomorrow or yesterday. It's now that I can experience, and it's there where I can have a spiritual experience, nowhere else. And uh, and nothing else is real. And my thoughts running off, uh, and me running after loving it, you know, just loving it, um, that's not real. You know, that's, that's, that's a shadow play in my head, and it frequently gets me into trouble, and I'm better off when I'm not thinking. So thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.